We have got Stephen Sayers with us today. We've had loads of people come on the podcast and say, yeah, this guy is hardcore. Um, we're going to get his story off him. He's got a movie in production. We've got one book out. We've got another book in development. All the links to Stephen's stuff are in the description box below this video. So please click down and, and <coughs> check out his stuff. And he's down here with Steve Rafe. And Steve's got a YouTube channel, so I'll put the link down to his YouTube channel. And there's loads of gangster stories and crazy stuff down there. If you're into this kind of stuff, please click down and support what both of these guys are doing. So thanks for coming on, Stephen. Yeah, thanks thank you very much. What is this book about then? Well, it's about my life, really, basically, you know. It's not glamorising crime. It's showing you the life of how I end up in the crime. The effect it had on my life. It had on me children, in which we are living my life, you know. It's an interesting, it's got a few highs, it's got a few lows, it's got a few... It put a smile on your face at the end of it, you know, hopefully, you know. So your family's quite prominent in the underworld, but let's go back to, like, where are you from and all that stuff. I'm from the West End of Newcastle, a place called Alzick. My family, or oh, a big family, my great grand had ten children, nine daughters, one, one boy, you know. All of them had four and five kids each. Year. Like, say, my dad had 40 full cousins on his mother's side. Wow. So they were all, like, say, uh, they're all barrow boys, and, and you know, that's where we stem from. My great grand was, she, like, she had all the barrows. The barrows were illegal at the time. And as a young kid, like, say, six years of age, me and my cousins would stand, it was a day's work in a sense, you know, I would stand the lamppost and look for police to stop my family from being arrested for street trading, you know? And I suppose, in a, in a sense, it made were a bit anti police, you know. So you're selling stuff out of wheelbarrows, what kind of merch? They were, they were like carts, you know, like some barrows for, not like wheelbarrows as you see in the building set, you know. It was, fruit, it was fruit, fruit and veg. Oh, like fruit and veg stands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's how you learned to get your hustle on as a youngster? Yes, it did, huh? And were you getting in any kind of trouble when you was a young person? Yes, especially if I didn't see the police come. <laughs> <laughs> you actually think it was a wheelbarrow, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to explain it for the Americans because they're not, they're going to be, they're going to hear barrow and think wheelbarrow. Yeah, yeah. I thought, fuck you, I can't believe you asked that. <laughs> it'd be a barrow, it'd be a barrow three foot wide to six foot long, you know. Yeah. I might ask you a few things that I already know the answer to, but in a way that the Americans can understand yeah, yeah, them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you want to get the accent to the English and understand it first. <laughs> <laughs> They have a hard time understanding it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what about early arrest then? Um, first arrest, I was 14 years of age. I came up with a nightclub called La Dolce Vita. 14 years of age. I got myself involved. Well, I was witnessing a big fight outside, you know. I got in a car with the lads. I thought it was good, yeah, bigger lads, you know. And, uh, they bumped into the lads again in the street. A fight erupted. Tools were used. One lad lost his eye. High speed chase from Newcastle City Centre. I got arrested. Uh, I got remanded. I went to court when I was 15 years of age. Got detention centre. The other lad got Borstal. One of them got two years. I came out of there and I applied for a licence for the barriers. But unfortunately, the licence is, would have been a conviction. I'd get a conviction. I wasn't allowed it, you know. So, in a sense, I suppose the days of Stephen Stephen started, you know. <laughs> you wanted to get on the straight and narrow. Yes, I did, yes, but unfortunately that happened, you know, sir. So, yeah. And uh, the other occupation I knew was Stephen, so that's the path I took. And were you, did you have a knack for fighting from a young age? I used to like to roll about, eh? I wasn't shy to have to roll about anybody. I wasn't trained or anything like that, just full of bad intentions, I suppose. Do you think that was just a natural thing then, a natural ability? I don't know, but I suppose I suppose it was just environment where I was brought up in, you know, and like survival. I suppose it's really different from different parts of Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. rough and tumble. Yes, yes, yeah, the rough and tumble, you get bullied. So if you can't go on the straight and narrow, then what are you going to turn your life to? After that? Well, I turned my life to crime, you know. I was I become a criminal. Uh, I got a conviction when I was eighteen for burglary and cash and carry. I got that one for trying to spread them that premises for cigarettes, you know, like high value stuff at the time. It was a young lad, you know. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> basically, that sort of stuff, you know. And how were you doing with your family at that point in your life? Well, I was a young single laddie, so uh, was it life was a big adventure for me at the time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and because you've been getting in trouble with the police, is that like, how are your parents, like, are they trying to steer you? Well, my dad had a, ver a variety of different jobs, you know, like, say, occupations, I should say. He was a barber boy. He had his own company, he had a haulage company. 
He also had a scrapyard, which I worked the scrapyard for him. When he worked the breweries, it was custom them days to like so when he delivered the beer, you would you would receive a bottle of courtesy of the people the bar the bomb and the manager of the bar would give you a bottle of beer, bite of beer. Yeah, basically that sort of thing, you know. So the man the day he was absolutely mortal drunk. <laughs> <laughs> he worked hard though, right? Oh yeah. Drunk hard. <laughs> <laughs> Because we got off the rails young on the drugs, like the ecstasy and the speed and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Did that come into it with you? Well, I think everybody did in the eighties, you know. Yeah. It hit, it hit, it hit Newcastle, you know, just like it was like a plague. It just had its bummer, just it, it took over the place, you know. Yeah. Uh, I come across it me in in Tenerife, in the in the eighties, mm. and uh, I used to contact the lads in Newcastle. I even found a few of the lads up in Liverpool last time. We heard ecstasy, <laughs> and I was saying, "Ah, you're dancing with lads." <laughs> So that was the first time coming across it, you know. So what was the rave scene like up there? Where you bouncing. from? I was bouncing when I heard it, you know, I just took over the place. Yeah. <coughs> um, people who you've never seen before in your life dance, tough guys were up dancing and all that, you know, so <laughs> give, give them a waffle on the dance floor. <laughs> it was good times, good times, you know. Yeah. I suppose it was the same all over the country when I take, you know. Well, that's drugs, it's, it's not the best in the world for you, but they were good at the time. <laughs> Let's be it was funny here. because there was like, just before it started, there was a lot of football violence in Manchester and Liverpool and that. But you'd see them about a year later in the rave and they're dancing together and hugging one another. And you think, fuck you, I'll like, you. You'd you never had, expect yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. If you had, if you had one of me down your neck in the 80s and you bumped your nose and you're kissing cuddle. Kissing yeah, cuddle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you would. You have no badness in you. Call them all nice and everything here. Mm -hmm. you know what it is. Is he the most enemy about a cuddle? Him? Yeah. <laughs> I love you. I love you. <laughs> I love you back. You too, bro. <laughs> I had a mate out of Manchester. Heath, do you remember him? He was a soccer hooligan. Yeah. yeah. He had all these fucking chains and he was all stabbed up and shit. He's like, I'm not coming to Liverpool, you know, that fucking all, all my hooliganism. So we brought him, was it like the state or one of those places? We're talking about the state, 8088. All the, all the hooligans are just hugging each other. Never yeah. seen anything like it. What that me? Yeah, on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. <laughs> we were fucking hammering it in Arizona. We're knocking we? shit out one another the week after and on, on Saturday, like, you know what I mean? It was strange when the streets Yeah. Time. <laughs> <laughs> so, when he was young, he looked up to people like the tax man and Duffy, and he was telling me all these stories. Good pals of mine, they told him. So, you grew up with them, did you then? Yes, I did, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Lee Duffy, uh, Lee Duffy was my friend, and he was the one who introduced us to Brian Cockrell. He phoned us up. Lee Duffy was a fighting man. Yeah. And he phoned us up and he said, "Stephen, I've just had the hardest fight in my life for the strongest man I've ever come across." And for Lee Duffy to say that this kid has got to be something special, see, that's how that's how I found out with Brian Cockrell. And he introduced us to Brian. We met each other. And we've gone and like a house on fire, you know. And we've been pals ever since. He's my big brother. And you said Brian was showing off uh, his skills one day. Abnormally strong. No, you've got the bend, mate. And I said to him, I said, listen, I know you have a strong lad, but how strong are you? He said, excuse me, Steve, do you just mind what we on side? So, what's he doing? He got behind the car and he lifted the back end of the car and he pushed it over. No, no, I'm not on the boat. Like, nice and there to there. I'm on the boat from there to there. Yeah. And five or six vehicles. <laughs> and this man was benching, you know, he's, he's squatting, he's squatting 300 three, three kilo, you know. So you can imagine how strong he's benching 250 kilo. <laughs> Abnormally strong. Uh, boxer. Full to the brim of bad intentions, a very dangerous combination. Yeah. On his day, I would have put Brian Cockrell down, probably the best man on the cobbles in the country. Really? That's, that's, you know, what could he do? I've seen him knock men out 20 stone with slaps. Slaps. Yeah. Drinking jaws with slaps. Yeah. Too strong, one. That's what you were saying, wasn't it? He was one of the hardest guys in the whole country at that yeah, time. Yeah, I was. He could pick a 20 stone man above his head, we know not a problem, just pick him straight up, you know? That's just, that's not, it's, he was going to go in for the strongest man, the uh, strong, strongest man, Britain competition, you know? Yeah. But uh, he went down the wrong path. But he's my pal, Brian. I've got a lot of time for him. You know, a lot of respect for him. Yeah, he's a great guy. He was in here. We watched his uh, documentary as well, McIntyre's Underworld. Yeah. Taxman. Have you seen that one? Taxman was a way to go, that one, was it? Yeah, good? yeah. You can, you can see him on there. You can see what he is, you know? Yeah, he's bouncing around in that, isn't he? In prison <laughs> down there, no one had a bad word to say about him. People. Especially to his face. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. Some people say, like, did you all... Duffy would be a bully, or not Duffy, uh, that Viv Graham's a bully and all this and all that. But when it got to Brian Cockrell, no one would say a bad word about him whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Good lad, good lad. I brought, um, I brought Lee Duffy through. Viv Graham had the reputation of being the fighting man of Tyneside. Yeah. And Duffy had one of the same, basically, for, for Tyneside, you know. So I brought Duffy through for, to fight him. 
Uh, it was going to be full of money, but it didn't take place, you know. We were West End. West End was like, say, heightened sort of people, you know, like that sort of area. And the, the doormen were all big lads from Gateshead. Yeah. And the West End used to always clash with them. The big lads were setting them up. The, the, the West End was shooting them or stabbing them back, you know. And this went on for a while. And I suppose when, when Duffy came, well, Duffy represented the West End as a fighter. And he wanted to be on the fifth game. I took, yeah. him, I took him to a club once. And he knocked about 10 of these doormen out, you know. <laughs> these people are like out. These aren't little lads, you know. These, some of them are 20 stone men, you know. I'll never get one. He was at the back and he went, come on, Duffy, I'll fight you. Duffy just marched forward, knocked him in the toe. Well, like, really baby dinosaurs on the floor, man. You're talking tonnage on the floor. Was that many that were talking tonnage on the floor? He didn't even look like a fight, so a bit of a handsome guy, really. You know what I mean? I don't know about that. How long were you in jail? <laughs> <laughs> Too long. What's this? Was this when you were doing your six? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> so how did he get so handy? Because he was an youngster, wasn't he, Duffy? Chain boxer, six foot three. He looked like Dolph Lundgren with the Rocky. The yeah. Rocky finish, you know? He was, when he's youth, he was, he was very bully when he was a young kid, you know? Mm. I think that had an effect on him when he was older. He had no fear. Yeah. No fear whatsoever, you know? Yeah, uh, school was telling me he was knocked out in jail when he got there. The old schools were new about him. Turned up there, came with the cell, walked along the passageway. He never had any cigarettes. School was smart. He took the tab off him, took the tab box out and had look, it was only three or four tabs in. Tell him to go out and buy him a pack of tabs. Yeah, it's not normal, you know. The school is not supposed to get nipped up and messages, it's going to be a bit of shopping. <laughs> yeah. And he, the school told me, the school told me that story. Yeah, they were scared of him. Terrified of him. Yeah. So when most people come across him, you know. So what was the story behind his demise? He had a lot of vicks in, the, in uh, Middlesbrough, you know. Um, he had an incident, fight starting, got stabbed a couple of times and got stabbed in the back. It wasn't exactly Victoria Cross material, was it, you know? Right. Uh, so he was a violent man who lived a violent, lived a violent life and he died a violent death. Yeah. yeah he, was a, he was a nice person, he was my friend, you know. And like, uh, Bit of a coward's way in the back, though, wasn't it? As I say, it's not exactly Victoria Cross material, no. is it? Didn't the taxman have a word with that guy? The both of them, that's how they got pals. The both of them had a fight with each other, you know, that's how they yeah. met each other. Yeah. Um, they got the gun, like, and then two gun, like a house on fire, you know, for a few months, and they, then they died, you know. Yeah. Um, good, good. They took them, they took them together. What a force. What mm. a force. Wow. You wouldn't like them showing up at your house. Well, they're going for the wall, not the door, them two, man. They're <laughs> <laughs> not coming through the door, they're coming through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. That's what I see about them. <laughs> All right, so you, you, you tried to stay on the straight and narrow. That, that didn't work out with the barrow, so you're getting into crime and Boston. Mm -hmm. um, you're in your 20s now. Rave scenes hit. The rave scene, what happened was, uh, on the 12th of August, 1987, my 22nd birthday, was a robbery committed through Sunderland, and it was Britain's biggest post office raid. The great train robbery was robbed on the, on the train, obviously. Coincidentally, it was robbed at Sears Crossing. <laughs> uh, my brother got me, the police went to my mum's to arrest me and my brother. I wasn't there, my brother got arrested, charged, put on remand for 12 months. A, a police officer came forward, she, uh, WPC, and she says, that isn't a man, but he resembles him. And she was the one who was going to pick me up and fit us up, you know, so mm. I spent a year on the run in the 80s to go and move abroad. Was, it was, you heard on the TV, you know, but you know, to actually take the trip abroad was a big thing at the time, yeah. you know. Ended up in Spain. Did you have people in Spain that welcomed you and took care of you? I always get on with scousers all over, you know. <laughs> and when you can, you can come up with scousers. <laughs> and the chances are one of them will be on the tours. <laughs> you can't yeah. have, not bump in through, can you? Yeah, can't it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we well, got you know, and I could introduce myself to different people around, around the country, you know, and they said, well, I was like, a helping hand if I needed it, you know. Yeah. Which, which I did, you know. I went down to London. Um, London, some London lads. Freddie Foreman. You know, different people like that. A sister, you know. Yeah, we've had... Um... Dave Courtney on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He spoke highly of you guys as well. Yeah, I saw some yeah. stuff he did on, on, yeah, on YouTube. Right, you know? Yeah. Man. So what's it like being on the run in Spain? I was on the run in Spain for a while, then mm. I ended up in Tenerife. From there we end up in... Uh, well, first of all, we started off in Blackpool. There was not many winter resorts you can go to in England. Blackpool's one, and Aviemore's the other. Now, I says to me cousin who was with us at the time, I says, no, look, if we get chased around Blackpool, we can't get away. If we get chased around Aviemore, you're stuck in the snow. Never go to Blackpool. Yeah. <laughs> so we went to Blackpool, we stayed until the last day, till the lights went off, you know, then we, 
we said to go to Tenerife, that's we went to Spain first, Tenerife, came back, uh, got sick of it, all of this. You can only stay in the sun and drink so much. Came back, I stayed on the, a boat on the island, put up Scotland for a while. Uh, came back and spent the last two and a half months, three months in this in a little flat in, in Newcastle, you know? Yeah. And I sat there one day and I was just sitting with the radio on, I think nothing, you know. And a news flash came on Radio One and says that two men have been acquitted for, for the robbery of Britain's biggest post office robbery. Uh, yes, and so once I got not guilty, I knew then I was okay, you know. Right. But until then, I was, it was worrying, you know. Well, and the police, like, all right, we're going to get set him up for something if he's got off this. Yeah. Is that what they did next? Well, they, what they're doing is, you know, they've ne they've never left where alone. They've, they've always been on my case, you know. They've always come and arrested me for some kind one drummed up charges. Yeah. Yeah, that's always happened. Excessive sentences, you know, the guidelines. The, the guidelines for the crimes always get flung out the window. And they say, I give a sentence of uh, two years, the guidelines. What can you work? I was sentenced, I got a 10 year sentence again. The Canadians were like three to four years, two to four years, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. So your first prison sentence was two years, your proper one after Boston? Uh, yes, it was. Huh? I got two years. I took what I'd done was I got told that um, a doorman had Sears, that the Sears family and the associates weren't allowed in the nightclub, you know. In the 80s, that would have been like putting petrol on a fire. <laughs> so we just had to go around and beat the shit out of them. <laughs> so I took Viv Graham around with us and um, he attacked them, bashed them up. Actually, the video's on YouTube. Is it? Viv Graham teamed up with members of a gang from Newcastle's West End. The gang wanted control over Hobo's nightclub in Bath Lane in Newcastle. The club's now closed, but in 1989, it was thriving using doormen and video cameras as security measures. This recording shows six men arriving at the club door. It's the first time it's been seen on TV. Viv Graham is last in, wearing a white shirt. It's a quarter to two on the morning of Saturday, September the 30th. The gang strides straight past the reception desk. Another camera shows the receptionist running upstairs to warn the manager. The head doorman, 28-year-old Stuart Watson, weighing 17 stone, approaches reception, hands in pocket. Viv Graham attacks him, cheered on by his companions. One shouts orders to the receptionist. Viv Graham now has a pressure point on Stuart Watson's neck, preventing him from defending himself. As the beating goes on, another doorman shows signs of intervening. A punch from one of the gang stops that. Stuart Watson is then dragged out of the camera vision onto the dance floor. The receptionist, in shock, desperately tries to wipe up the blood, then calls the police. The gang depart, led by Viv Graham. They'd been in the club for just three minutes and 41 seconds. As they swagger out, one pauses to tell the manager that it was a private fight. Viv got 18 months for chinning the man, I got two and a half years for watching it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So what's fucked up, that, isn't it? <laughs> Cans with a tote, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Conspiracy. Mm -hmm. uh, what prison did you go to? For the two years I went to Doom, and I went to, went to, went to Acklinton, you know, mm -hmm. for, the, for, the two, for the two years. And I um, got, got a bit of pip for rule, you know, on it, you know, so uh, see, it's a couple of weeks on it, I suppose. What was your reception like in Acklinton? Well, you've been, you know, I can't be home from home, man. Uh, it's, it's a local jail. It's a local jail, you know. But the one you liked, yes, yes. yeah, loved it there. It was like them days. Um, then Hansfree regimes hadn't been installed in them, so therefore it was all everybody's open it all day, smoking weed and drinking beer, <laughs> and that's what he'll tell you. Free <laughs> weights, fucking like, you got the gym any time you wanted. You can get drunk any time you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> The Scottish would come in from having the weekend visits. They'd have semi-jesics and they'd have bottles of whiskey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if Brilliant. you want a night on the drink, you can go and buy yourself a bit of Charlie and a bit of and a bit of vodka yeah. for the night. Everything, everything apart from, apart from a young lady. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're not being claimed to the jail, like but I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the guards all corrupted. <clears throat> I would imagine one or two, well, you know. Yeah, that's how they got the stuff in. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Yeah. I used to come over the fence, there was a new up in jail, it was a category C jail, you know. Just over the fence. Just slung over the fence, you know. What about um, visits? Do people visit you? Of course, right? I've got a big family, you know. Yeah. There's never short of visits, you know, a couple of weeks. How does, how does that feel to have your visits? 
Well, this is obviously, you know, you've yeah, been down that road. It's one visit what sticks in my mind was, was a sad one. My me, me son came on a visit with his school friend and he pointed us and he went, look, I've got a dad, there's my dad. And, I, and them's the B-sides, you know, it's all glamorous sitting in there and, you know, you got loads of money, fast cars, loads of birds, yeah. everything you want. You're sitting in prison and your son comes up on the visiting room, you know, and says, look at these friends, and like, oh, I've got a dad, there's my dad. It does affect you, and it hurts. I used yeah. to hate it visits, me. I it used to go, go back to be cell depressed after the visit. You know what I mean? I never I'm going back off drunk. <laughs> 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 well, you can take a bit of drink in the day, you can have a drink. I hate the visits because my, my brothers would bring me 100 quid up and it was just... It was just so easy, you just passed it under the table, don't right, you? Of course. Mean? Yeah. You it, that's it. It's an anti climax, isn't it? Someone comes all the way to see you, then you go back to your cell, and you fucking are, oh, you know. Well, you had people coming from England to visit you in America, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, my family flew about 5,000 miles, yeah, yeah. Mine don't love me that much. <laughs> 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 I'm older, what happens to come to Ackland's?